Has everybody got a, everybody should have now a sphygmometer, if you can say that, on your desk, is that right? And hopefully a stethoscope, is that right? Yeah. No, some people haven't got stethoscopes. Is Bob there? Um, Bob should have got them out. Okay, so what you do is you open the box up and inside the box should be a stethoscope and a sphygmometer, is that right? They're probably the stethoscopes that are inside the little bag. Okay. It's like party time. So what you're going to do on your person by the side of you, come on. if this was Christmas you would have had it undone in no time. Okay, is you're going to wrap up the sleeve if you've got a long sleeve um, on either arm, it doesn't matter. Roll it up so that you can actually see the crease of the elbow here. And you're going to simply wrap the cuff round with the Velcro nice and tight around the uh, elbow, around the upper arm there. So you undo here. Okay, so stick your arm out and out. Didn't they? Okay. So you wrap it round with the Velcro, reasonably tightly, that's it. Take the, uh, the bag off the dial here. Okay. Uh, attach the end of the stethoscopes <laughs> to the diaphragm. Okay, you put it together, it's a self-assembly, a bit like a pack, pack kit, flat, flat packed. Okay, that's it, that'll deafen you nicely, all right, okay. Now, these stethoscopes and sphigs are, are very cheap, okay? That's why we got them. <laughs> okay, you can get very expensive ones um, which fit more comfortably onto the ear. You know, these are quite tight on the ear. If you wear them for long periods, they will hurt you a bit, but for short periods. Now, you put the, the diaphragm, the, the, you're going to play the doctor, okay? You're going to put that into your ears because you're going to be listing hers. And then you place the diaphragm, that's this flat bit, on the middle part there, so you just hold that. Mm -hmm. So you're placing it there on the brachial artery. Okay? And then, you've not got one? Oh, yes. Okay. And then you... You're, no sound. Okay, you then pump up... Oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> you, on the pump, you'll find there's a, there's a, 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 a knob. Turn the knob clockwise, right? so you, you're not allowing the air to come back down into the pump, okay? And then you pump hard. You'll see it go up on the dial. Take it up to about 180, quite fast. Don't dither around, because it's painful to stay up for any length of time. Take it up to 180, and then start slowly to release the knob. And you should then start to hear the pulse come in. That'll be the systolic blood pressure. Measure that. Dum, 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 dum. So when you hear the thump, 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 that's the upper blood pressure, the systolic one. And when the pulse goes off, that's the lower one, which is the diastolic. Do a little film round, Gary, of the people playing doctors and nurses. <laughs> Okay, everybody should have... Uh, I can't hear a Dickie Bird. You can't hear a Dickie Bird, well. He's still alive. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, now you may want to just take the second hand on your watch and measure the person's pulse. So have a feel of their radial pulses and count it for 15 seconds and multiply it by four. So, so you feel the pulse, the radial pulse, count for 15 seconds. So yours is absolutely perfect, 72. What? If I fancied you, my pulse 
would have done racing, wouldn't they? That's how the Chinese used to work. They could always tell whether somebody was lying or caused the stress by the pulse. The doctor was only allowed to feel the pulse. Oh, really? So they'd ask you a question and then they'd measure, oh, it is it going slow, fast, it would speed it up, <laughs> or slow down if it was a shock. Okay, now let's get to the. Uh, okay, now let's get to the clinical application of this. There's a lot of noise, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do now on each other is to test the subscapularis muscle. So can I just borrow you there? If you stand up, that's it. Okay, so what you're going to do is is you can do this sitting or standing. Hand out flat. All right, this is very important the hand is out flat. Medially rotate the glenohumeral joint. Make sure they don't um, uh, recruit by moving the arm too far up or down. And you're going to push the hand backwards against me. So you're nice and strong. And then we'll do the other side. So push backwards on the hand, nice and strong. Okay. So do this now on each other. If you can't use the arm, don't worry about it at this stage. I'll teach you how you can use the other one. You can just swap over on CV22. Okay. So you must test everybody's subscapularis muscle. Put the stethoscope into the patient's ears, not yours. <laughs> Put the stethoscope into the patient's ears and now test the subscapularis on both sides. Without the sphygmometer, no. You're just going to do what I did with John. Just the, only the stethoscope, okay? Put it in, put it on the heart, okay? The, Part goes in the ears, the other end goes on the heart, on herbs point. Okay, remember where herbs point is? The third intercostal on the left, on the left. So it's there. Okay, you must be on herbs point. Okay, now you've got to be able to comfortably hear your own sound. Okay, you, you hold it. Okay, the patient is going to hold the diaphragm while you test the subscapularis. Okay, the patient holds the diaphragm. Put it inside the clothes, you'll get too much other noise. Go, to, go down the top. <laughs> okay. Right, so you just go down onto the point. Patient hears the noise, then you test the subscapularis. Okay, so you push that way. I'm pushing that way. Yeah, you're internally rotating, medially rotating. Okay, just like I did with John there, he, he was pushing to the floor because he's lying down. So you push, push against me. Okay, so you're going that way, and I'm trying to do that. Okay, so on the other one, it's the same thing. You'll be pushing behind you with the hand. If what? Well, he's weak to begin with, you mean? Yeah, on the, on the left one. Oh, you can't. You're sore on the right, but the left one shows up as being weak with the stethoscope. That's all you need, yeah. Yeah. No, what she meant, I think, is the other muscle. How do we test sitting down? Because she could show with that, couldn't she? Yeah, they, they nearly always show with this one on one side or the other. Start on the one side, then when you want to test the other side, which is your bad side, you would touch CV22 and use the good one, and that swaps you to the other shoulder, other brain. Yeah, which is your good shoulder, the left one. Uh, yeah, so you would touch CV, you still use your left arm, but with your right hand you touch CV22 so that it swaps over the corpus callosum. So you can then test with using the, you're testing the right shoulder using the left. <laughs> Thank 
Clive, Clive, what did you show up to being positive? No. No? Rubbish. Come on now, out you come. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Impossible that somebody is perfect. Okay. So everybody will weaken, don't worry. It's not if they don't weaken there's a problem. I should take your jersey off if I am. Remember, a perfect cardiograph is as rare as a perfect occlusion. You strengthen to it, yes. Try the other arm then. Yes, uh, sir. Okay. How could you strengthen? Because you're in strength to begin with. Oh, that's why. Yeah, because it indicates it's the heart. Now, you can't use an arm if it's weak. As I told you, you can't use a subscapularis if it's weak to begin with because feeding it back is what weakens you, okay? So you have to fix the weak subscapularis or use the other arm. You can use the other arm, but if that doesn't go weak with the hearing, it's because it's the other one which is the positive. So you touch CV21 <laughs> on the top of the manubral sternal and then it swaps the side in the corpus callosum. Okay, right, okay, come and stand. Just undo the top button there. Okay. So everybody observe here. So we're going to take the left side first, and he's simply going to keep the hand flat and push backwards against me. Okay? So quite strong. So push backwards. Okay. So he's quite strong, isn't he? Okay. He is. Oh, huh. Now, push backwards against me. Okay. Is he good at arm wrestling? Never done it with Clive. Let's make sure the stethoscope works first. Okay, so put that on, and then we'll go to Herb's point, which remember is just on the left side, of about the third, do you give me? So you hold, um, let's get him to hold it. Because obviously he's got to hold it on, right, right in the middle there, that's it, good. Okay. Now, can you hear your heart? No. <laughs> okay. Can I hear his heart? I'm not here. It's a mirage Okay, I'm gonna go a bit further south with him. <laughs> so we're gonna go down more towards the apex. Okay, we've got a nice sound there. The the apex is a, a good place to pick up. Can you hear it? Can I can I hear it? I can hear it. Can he hear it? No? He's a bit deaf, I think. I'm not, actually. You're not. <laughs> okay, push backwards here. Okay, now hold that one on there. Push backwards. Okay, right, now keep the shoulder. He's trying to see what he's trying to do. He's trying to recruit like Billio. Okay, get, get it back down again. Yeah, okay. Right, push backwards. Okay, so he'll be easier, in fact, if we lay him down. So let's lay you down. So if you don't have the program um, at this stage, don't worry about it, all right? You can still do everything I'm doing, but you won't have the science behind it to show the patient and to show colleagues. Okay, so now let's... Uh, okay, you, you hold that with that hand. Can you hear it? It's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since he's heard himself. Okay. No, no, he's fine. He just doesn't, can't, he, I think he's listening for blub dub, blub dub, blub dub. It's, it's very quiet, particularly when you lie on your back because it's sunk back there. But he's beating there and he's beating fine. Can't hear a thing. You can't hear a thing. Well, you do, but you can't consciously hear it with the background noise, I think. Okay, push down with the hand. So here he goes nicely, wait, push, push down with the hand. Okay. Okay, so I've taken the, the, the stethoscope, push down with the hand, <laughs> pop it back on. <laughs> okay. It's been a long time, Clive, since you've heard yourself. Absolutely. In the, in the world. Push down. So he's fine. So uh, we, I mean he's fine insofar that he's reacting as he should react if he's got a problem, which everybody does. So what do we do now? 
Okay, so we do the eye positions or the cranial, etc. So breathe in. I usually breathe out. Usually what I do is I do the eye position here using the positive one. So follow my finger to the left and up. So eyes to the left and up is nutrition. Push down. So he doesn't want that at the moment. Eyes to the left, straight across, is toxicity. Push. Eyes to the left and down is structure. Push. Okay. Now at this stage, do the breathing. I have to. So breathe in. Hold it. Push. Ah. Breathe out. You saw what happened. Hold it. Push. He's compressed. No wonder he can't hear anything. <laughs> Okay, so let's work out which, which muscle to use as our indicator. So we're just going to do some straightforward cranial work. Okay, so uh, hum for me, Clive, but not a tune that you know. Okay, so he's strong on when we use the left leg, which means the right brain. So by default, that must mean his left brain is the one down. Okay, we're all agreed. So therefore, we use that, the right-hand side one. So let's do the same thing. Let's go for... Touching with your thumb, just behind, first of all, the front inside the teeth, with your thumb. Okay, so just close to the inside of the teeth. Okay, pull, and now go back a little bit. You're heading up the roof of your mouth towards the cruciate, and usually at the cruciate there's a little lump. It's called the torus palatini, and sometimes it's very big, that lump. And there it is. How far are you back? Are you on the, the cruciate yet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's about on that cruciate. Breathe, look, look, he's gone beyond the cruciate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, stay on there, breathe in. Okay, hold it, pull. Okay, that's it. So now, thumbs in there, all right? Right back to the, you, you're right on the top, so the last molars you're going on, on the top jaw. Remember the maxilla works in this way, okay, internal or external, res, exper, external rotation, internal. So he's going in there on the bone, not the teeth, remember? Okay, in you go. Okay, right back. And on inspiration, you gap it, you pull it apart. Fairly firmly. Don't worry if the jaw comes out. <laughs> <laughs> We've never had one yet where it's... <laughs> okay, but it really opens up. And he should follow this up by doing six or ten times after he's cleaned his teeth every night. Because the chances are he's bitten this problem in. He's biting it. By biting, he's... he's um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's joking. He, he's uh, compressing the suture. He's, he's got a compression of the suture. Okay. Remember, having done the cruciate, or really the intermaxillary one, we then got to do the sagittal, the love it brother. Okay. Good. Six. You've done six. Good. Mm -hmm. Touch on the on the spot again, with what? the thumb. Yeah. So let's make sure he's okay. Okay. Now, go on here. So we'll start on the on the front and just here. Pull. Keep working your way back. It'll be exactly the same place as on the suture in the mouth. See? Right at the back there. See? Just nothing there, Clive, is there? Look. Okay. Uh, inspire. It'll be the same, but we'll do it just to show you. Inspiration. Okay. So, in and out. In and out. So, I'm being fairly firm. In and out. I like how you confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> and out. In. And out. <coughs> in. And out. In. And out. You can feel his hemispheres coming apart. <laughs> <laughs> in. And out. In. And out. Yeah. So luckily we fixed that one. Okay, so let's pop him back in now. Okay, you go in. They go that way. That's it. So we'll take that down to about there. Just hold that with your right hand. He's, he's heard it. Good. Okay. It's very loud. It's very loud. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? If you ever want proof, as I say, of cranial work, of what cranial, the effect on the primary respiratory motion, this does it. When you see, we didn't record his, but we've seen without the recording just how powerful it is, how potent. 
Okay, and what that does is, what he, what his problem was, the cranial fault decreased his first sound, which is why he couldn't hear it. Okay, right? But we could only just about hear it. We, we didn't tell him that, but he was right down. You see, because it's been compre he was compressed because he strengthened on both inspiration and expiration, so he was well and truly compressed. So what we do now is push down with your hand. Okay, so he's nice and strong because we fixed the cranial. Now let's go around the positions again. So the cranial really is probably one of the first things you should actually do because it is so potent. Push. So across. No, follow the finger. Follow my finger. When they don't follow your finger, they're thinking about other things. You know, their mind's on something else. So left and down for other structural problems. Over to the right and down. Let's see if there's something that he's eating. Follow the finger. Over to the right is exercise or ATP. Uh, to the right and up is, is dehydration. Back. <laughs> See, what a mind he's got. Oh, this mind it must be full of rubbish. <laughs> it's going round and round and round. Anything but follow the finger. <laughs> Keep following the finger, Clive. Okay, follow the finger. Good. Okay, one more to do. Up and down. Push, push. <coughs> what does that mean? Hypoxic. He's hypoxic. Okay, so what do I do for hypoxia? Really, the hypoxia is the first one that you want to test um, because hypoxia, oxygen, is the ultimate nutrient, really, isn't it? You know, if you've got nothing else, if you haven't got the oxygen, you're in trouble. So we know that his first sound was right down, plus he hasn't got enough oxygen. And no wonder he's. Um, that's oxygen, O2. So push down. That just confirms the hypoxic eye movement. So he strengthens to O2. Now, I have my own sequence. Um, and in my mind, what I do is I think of oxygen. First of all, I want to get it into the red cells. So I think about iron. Okay, so here I would test him with iron, ionized iron because iron is the core of the heme, a globin molecule. So that's what actually, without iron you can't carry the oxygen. Push down. You see, notice now that I've done the eye position, he's gone into weakness, okay? So it's opened up that department, if you like. So he's not strengthening to iron. Which not many people do, because they, sub they add it to so many things, okay? Now the next thing we want to do is see if he's got enough B12. So B12 matures the red cells, it in fact matures every cell, but they see it and they measure it in the red cell. But let's not forget it, it matures the white cells and everything else. So we do hydroxycobalamin, which is your raw B12, and then we do adenosyl, which is one of the coenzyme forms, and then we'll do methyl. So that includes then the, the, the B12s. Now also involved in the um, maturation or the making, really, of hemoglobin is pyridoxal 5-phosphate. So P5P is a very important component of the manufacturing of the heme part of hemoglobin. So that's okay. Right, now we've got to get the oxygen by diffusion. And this is how it gets in. The pressure in the lung drives it across from the air, the alveoli, into the capillaries and into the red cells. It's literally just the pressure change by diffusion. That gets it into the red cells. The red cells then discharge it by diffusion to the areas where the O2 tension is low. So it's got to get out of the membrane of the red cell, across the blood vessel wall, the capillary, and into the cell adjacent. So there's three membranes it has to go across. So this is why what we do is we test the fatty acids. So at this stage we want to make sure that these fatty acids are good. So we're testing for his fatty acids. So we could use, um, do we have a sample, Jill, um, of the, uh, the new oil, the smart oil? Have you got a marker? So I'll just go through a few of these. So olive oil, pretty useless for him. I like indigenous oils. 
grape seed. You're not going to get these in Ireland, okay? You don't get olives growing there, do you? And you don't get grapes. What? Is he a green? Are you a green? Yeah. Yes. Okay, hazelnut. That's a local oil. He likes that, strong with hazelnut. Okay, let's try him on the, the new smart oil complex. Push. No. Nope. Okay, so he's shown positive to hazelnut. So what have we got? Walnut. Lovely oil, but not for Clive. Uh, sesame seed. Push. Strong. So he's looking like a green oil, isn't he? So peanut. Not many peanuts in Ireland, but he's strong. <laughs> uh, and that's the wonder oil. Okay, so basically I think the green oil will be the one for him. He's taking green oil. That's good, you're on the right track then. One tablespoon, one tablespoon a day, yeah. Have you got any green oil that you want to see whether one tablespoon is enough? Do you want to pour one tablespoon of green oil? Would you like some more green oil? Like yes, he's going to buy a bottle so we can open that one. <laughs> Push. Okay, now... How do I know whether that's the only thing he needs for hypoxia? Yeah, well, you could do that, um, but the quickest way is just to take him up and down in the hypoxia eye position again. Okay, and if he blows out now, you'll know there's something else. Okay, do you want a glass? Yeah. Okay, push. So no. He needs the oil and that's it. Okay, now we're going to measure how much oil you need. Okay, now... So that would have completed this side of the, uh, the story. All right, so you, you're fully up to date now. All right, so what are we going to do? Put you back in there. Okay, now what do I do now? We can say his left side is complete. So I'm leaving the oil marker on him, or the glass or whatever we want, and now I'm going to the other side. So remember how strong Clive was? Push down to the floor. Okay, so when you've completed the one side, the other side will open up. If it doesn't open up, you haven't completed the other side. So don't try and say, oh, his right side's fine. It's not. Okay, it's just that you're not finding it because there's still something on the other side. Nine times out of ten, that will be a cranial fault that probably that you've missed. So let's just, do you want to pour it in, Joe? Only one tablespoon. <laughs> okay, let's measure it up. So... Now do one, one teaspoon first, and we'll do it one by one. Okay, so you, you carry on holding there, okay. and we have this, which means we've run out of hands, doesn't it? So there's a little bit of a juggling trick now. So you hope they've got the right shaped tummy when you do this. Push down. So one spoon does nothing. Do you take it on a spoon? Yes. Do you? Brave man. I do mine as a mayonnaise. You can do it in whatever way you want. I just make a mayonnaise regularly of the, of the one that's shown. What's that? That's three, isn't it? He's not even... Nothing's happening to him at all. Four. See what, what Jill said is essential fatty acids are one of the most chronic deficiencies that people have. Why? So he needs five teaspoons. Okay. So the question is, is why does he need so much oil? Okay. We're about to find out because the other side will tell us why. Right? Now we've got two choices. Either somebody else or some other thing is taking the oil from him and he's not getting what he's ingesting. Or he's taking in the wrong types of oils and he's needing to replace those. Okay. So he may be good. He may take his three teaspoons or one tablespoon every day but on the other hand side he could be eating Dunkin Donuts mm -hmm. okay which are full of trans fats or oxidized oils and of course his body's taking up those bad fats and he's got to replace them so it could be that as well but we're about to find out so what we're going to do is we'll pop the oil back on you all right so you're nice and strong remember what we did is we just took him up and down up and down He's remained strong, and then what we're going to do is we're going to pop him around the other end. So can you sit up? <laughs> okay. So you can see, that's all the only reason I'm doing that. 
You don't have to do that with your patients. You don't have to swap them around. Okay. Okay, so now, of course, we've got to swap hands here and push towards the floor, Clive. Okay, now, start again. Okay, we could start with inspiration. <coughs> breathe in. Push. Breathe out. Right out, right out, right out, right out. Push. Okay, breathe normally. Okay, now we start here. It'll be unusual for the cranial to still show because you just fixed that. So anything that you just fixed is unlikely to show again. So nutrition over to the left and up. Push down. Now, so you, it is not short of anything. Over to the left. So we're now testing for toxins. Push. Now, okay. Left and down. Push. Over to the right and down. Push. Right and across. Push. Okay, for exercise. Right and up for water. Okay, push. Okay, round and round. Push. 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 Pleasure. No, you're not. <laughs> right, follow it again. Okay, right round, that's it. Push. Okay, got him. All right, follow it round the other way just to make sure. Right the way round, that's it. Push. Okay, so we've got a bug. Okay, and nine times out of ten, when, when you go to the second side, you've either got a toxin or a bug. So the next question is, which bug has he got? So we want the box, the basic Genesis box. It's in the bag. Oh, in the back. Is that Where's the? No. Where's the basic one with the markers? Well, then somebody took it. Oh, you moved them. Oh, yes, right. You made it look nicer. <laughs> made it more confusing. Right, okay, so we've got bacteria, viruses, fungi. Okay, so we divide our bugs up into um, funguses. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to put the composite of all the funguses on, push down, And then we're going to do bacteria. That's a combination, push down, of gram positives and gram negatives. Push down, so no bacteria in there. Then we're going to do virus. That includes acute viruses and post virus. Push down. Now, so that just leaves one thing. Push down. Okay, push down. Okay, so we've got a parasite. So now what we could do, if you've got the necessary kits with the different types of the parasites in, you could work out which parasite it is. Um, not sure we got that one here. Do we, we need a... Um, Yeah, it's I the diagnostic that. pain box one. Yeah. yeah. Let's see, because what we do do divide parasites into different groups, and parasites are single cell protozoa, microscopic like amoebas, that sort of thing. And they're multicellular but still microscopic called sporozoa. And then you get what we call the big boys, um, or helminths. So you get the round ones, the nematodes, you get the hollow ones or cestodes, and you get the fat ones called trematodes. Okay? But we don't tell patients that. We just say most of them are microscopic. You wouldn't even see them. <laughs> play, play it cool. Okay, so what we do, just to, just to help Clive along, you know, make him feel good. Right. Yeah. 
And we'll do these. So trimmer turns, hammer turns. So when you go back to Deirdre tonight, you can say that you came away feeling fit and you came back from England with a parasite. <laughs> it was a bit rotten. Okay, so sporozoa, no particular order. Push down. So he strengthens very nicely to sporozoa. That's a multicellular, but still microscopic. You know, it's genuine. Okay, trematode, those are flat worms, remember. He's okay on those. I call those barnacles. Uh, cestodes, those are the hollow ones. Push down. And then we've got uh, nematodes, which are um, round worms. Nine out of ten are um, vermicularis, enterobus victimaris, which is threadworm. You know, you can almost guarantee when that shows up. And then we've got protozoa, which is the single cell microscopics. So what we've got is a sporozoa. It really doesn't matter what the sporozoa is in reality, um, because what we want to do is to find out what the remedy is, isn't it? Okay. So if we take that off, we know he strengthens to the sporozoa. Okay. So if I put the sporozoa on and test a strong muscle, what's going to happen to the strong muscle? He'll go weak. But which leg do I use? Okay, remember we're now working on his right brain, aren't we? Therefore we use the left leg, that's it. Let's do the right leg just to confuse you, <laughs> just to show you, you can let go of that one because we're not into Paul, he's nice and strong. But when we do this one, Paul, <laughs> if, he's, if he doesn't believe me, now he does. <laughs> okay, all right. It's so pronounced, you know, there is no power there at all, I can guarantee. And it, you know, that's what I like about muscle testing is this th there's no wishy-washy half bets, it, it's completely off. So if we tested with his right one, we've come to the conclusion, no, he hasn't got sporozoa, but yes, he has. Okay, so the remedy is... What? A spice, yes, spice would be good, black walnut, whatever you find, really. Um, I can't tell you um, directly, but the green spice mix... Green spice mix. Is, sorry, I've got. Uh, have I got a green spice mix? Is that the green spice mix? Yeah. Yes, the green spice mix. The green spice mix is star anise, ginger, and cumin. I think. Can you just look that up if you've got? Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I left the sporozoa on at the moment, Paul, and the green spice mix actually doesn't work for him. All right? So pop that one down. What about the herbs? What about the herbs? Yeah. Could be the herbs. But probably... Um, what we find very good on infections, particularly when you come to it this way, is straight ginger. You know, ginger is one of the green spice mixes, but ginger as a capsule oh, will. Oh, other leg, yeah. <laughs> hey, I, was, uh, I could have said he was strong. Yeah. He is waking up. See, it's, it's doing his head. Pull. Okay. Now, ginger works very well. So, what I'm going to do is you go back with the, you, you, your stethoscope in there. I'm going to take the uh, green one off. So, we leave, remember, we're leaving on the. Uh, the original green wonder oil on. Okay, you ha you go there. So I can go back to using the subscapularis now. Okay. Hold on, I can't hear myself. You can't hear yourself. Ooh. You're a bit too low, that's it. You hold. Move it around a bit more. Very funny, you've got a credit card in there or something. <laughs> Oh dear. Try that. Yeah, that's what we've got to test. I think you got those around the wrong way. That's why. Put them around. Make sure you, when you put the stethoscope on, 
the EBITs face that way. Yes. Not, not that way. It's a great help. <laughs> okay, right. So, uh, push down. Okay, so let's try the ginger now here. Yeah? So, probably sporozoa can certainly get systemic, but most of them are in the gut. Um, so, we're going to use probably preference, we would use capsules. Push. Okay. Now, I just happen to be lucky, I just happen to have some ginger caps on me. Now, these will make you sweat, Clive, but you won't hear that. <laughs> Ten minutes after taking ginger, he'll come up with a nice heat. It's a heating spice, isn't it? Push down. And that means he's getting his immune system to work because everything's going into um, like a, um, a respiratory burst. Push. So his immune system will come into life and those sporozoa will get out fast. Push down. Push down. Now why did I choose five? He's almost six. Uh, push down. Yeah, okay. So we'll take one away. Push down. Yeah, so he's definitely five. Now five may be too much for him. Take it with a meal. Push down. Because five is going to really boil him up. So, <laughs> but he can't hear any of this, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, he's clever, he takes it out of one ear. What time of the day? Three times a day. Um, but let's check that. Okay, so back in, back on there. Okay, now we've got a problem because we're short of hands, aren't we, okay, to do this. So what we have to do is we'll have to gently press on the stomach point ourselves just to stimulate it. Push down, strong. Push on the small intestine, push down. Circulation sex, push down. So we're just as a control, we push on the heart, meridian, heart one there. Yeah. All right, so it's three times a day for him at the moment. But he probably only needs to take it for a few days, just to sort of start. He'll know, really. Does he need anything else? Round and round again, okay. If that weakens, either he needs something else or that's not the best remedy. Push, <coughs> but he's staying nice and strong. So we go around the other way. Push, <coughs> nice and strong. So that's your marching orders. That's why he can't get his oils up, okay? Because he's got a parasite in there. Parasites love oils. Sam, what else do they love? You, you're a great one on parasites. Iron, isn't it? Iron. Uh, crocodiles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fructose. They like fructose, do they? All oh, right, okay. <laughs> but remember, years ago we found that, didn't we? Whenever someone shows consistently they need a nutrient, the chances are somebody else is taking it. And particularly iron, because they bleed in there and particularly essential fatty acids because they just love those. And the better the quality of the oil, the better the parasite grows. Okay? So yes, he does need the oil on one side, but he also needs something to get rid of it. And the finest you know, detoxifiers uh, are spices and herbs and you know, the usual things we're used to. The great thing about spices is they're organic and they're freshly ground and freshly pressed. So they've got the oils in them. It's the oils really within the ginger which is the powerful thing to get rid of. So when we come to look at it in a little bit later on, the oils are extremely powerful as far as the aromatherapy, uh, the connection with the oils and the emotions. Mm -hmm. So probably we'll find ginger will come in as an aromatherapy oil for him from the emotional point of view as well. Because although we've got him everything in the biochemistry line, you know, he's done really well. Okay, so he's nice and strong here. Uh, push down. Okay, now the final bit which we'll do a bit later on, is I'm going to touch the emotional stress reflex point just below the frontal eminence, halfway between the eminence and the eyebrow. Do you remember why we use that? It's where the orbital frontal lobes of the frontal cortex are, which is the thinking part. So I'm going to touch the right to the left, okay? So I'm comparing right with the left, push down, and then we're going to touch the left to the right, okay? Just as we did with the amygdala, push down, okay? So there's our emotion. So we'll finish off, when we get to the end of the day, we'll finish off and, and test him out with the, the emotion. 
All right? So we got, can't send him home without getting that heart really harmonized to the head. Good. Okay, so let's have a walk. Anyway, the, um, now we won't give him the ginger yet, just in case, um, you know, because we, we, once you've taken it, I can't get back. Okay, was that yours? That was yours, I think.